Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 169. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast, a podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I am glad that you're here today because we're going to talk about a subject that you need to know about as you go out there to build your business, generate more cash flow, and heaven forbid, should you try to build a real estate portfolio that is larger than you can handle yourself, you're going to have to learn how to do something. You know what that is? You're going to have to learn how to lead. That means leading people. Yep. Getting a group of individuals to go the same direction at a similar time to actually accomplish a goal, that is a skill set, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to talk with an expert today, Mr. Hans Fensel. He's a successful author, mentor, speaker, and a trusted authority in the field of leadership. He is the host of the Leadership Answer Man podcast. That's called The Clue. Go check that out. Hans uh, Hans has trained leaders internationally on five different continents, and he and Donna founded HD Leaders in 2012, where he serves as president. Help me welcome Hans Fensel. Hans, how are you doing? I'm doing just great, Jay. Good to be on your show today. Excellent. Glad that you are indeed here. Now, one of the things that I always like to do is I always start out with a very similar question for everybody. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, the people that fly around in tights, they get all dressed up and save people using their unique skill sets or tool belts, etc., to improve the quality of life of those that they are serving. I feel that today's entrepreneurs do the exact same thing. However, before they were a superhero, before they put on their capes, they were pretty much just normal people and they had an origin story. So what I would love to know is before you were the author, mentor, and speaker, an authority on leadership, who is Hans Fensel? I love that question. We all have interesting origin stories. Most people wonder what the name Hans Pinzel, you know, where am I from? From the old country, yeah. you know? <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. <clears throat> uh, yeah, from Deutschland or Austria or Switzerland, but actually I was born and raised in Huntsville, Alabama. And people say, well, now wait a minute, see, you're laughing already. So how can a guy with the name Hans Stinsel be from Huntsville, Alabama. Right. But uh, my origin, pure German. There were a group of German rocket scientists that came to America after World War II uh, under the leadership of a famous scientist, Dr. Werner von Braun, the man who figured out how to put us on the moon. And my dad worked for that man. He was one of the this German rocket scientist team who ended up in Huntsville, where they actually started NASA I mean, back in the 1960s. So wow. I was born and raised in a German family. German is my first language. And as a side note, uh, Werner von Braun, a lot of books have been written about him. The movie October Sky was about a little boy who worshipped him. And a great lesson on leadership, he was a visionary who said he convinced John F. Kennedy, you know, we can put a man on the moon if you'll give us some money. And to me, one of the great traits of leadership is uh, taking people where they don't think they can go by themselves. So that's my origin. I've spent most of my career in business and also the nonprofit world. So that's sort of what and I'm also father of four wonderful children. That's a, definitely a strong part of my story. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Now, I, just because you, you you bring it up, especially with German being your first language, I'm just wondering if if you or your mom can make a really good bratwurst. Because man, I miss that. Oh yeah, beer and brats, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. You come on over, and I'll throw some brats on the barbecue grill, and we'll have some great German beer and brats. Oh. Absolutely. 
Exactly. Uh, people just don't understand. I grew up military, and, and the one thing I miss from Germany is the food, especially the meat and the pastries. And I try to tell people, you don't understand. You haven't really had meat until you've been there. It's just a whole different thing. It's all it different. is so, so true. So true. Now, you mentioned leadership being something where – you take people where they don't see that they can go alone. Expand a, a little bit about that, because that was in an interesting statement. Well, uh, leadership is influence, and it, really the history of the world is a story of leadership. Great leaders and terrible leaders who did incredible good and incredible harm. And that's that's what leaders do. They influence they take people. And I think for every uh, leader, there's probably 100 to 1,000 followers. You know, leaders of the, the Stephen Jobs of the world who think up these amazing things. And then you need a whole lot of followers to actually make it happen. So that's why I say <laughs> leaders take people. You know, they're the ones that think up where we're going to go. We're going to cross this bridge. We're going to build this bridge. And then the engineers figure out how to build it, and the finance guys figure out where to get the money to build it. <laughs> I know. The I leaders love that don't, analogy because don't... I don't really like finance people. They're always telling us we don't have enough money to build this bridge. And I'm like, but we got to build a bridge. Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're ignoring the fact that we don't care what we don't have. Here's where we're going. You guys figure out how we're going to get there. <laughs> you know, at the end of yeah, the day, right. it doesn't matter. We're we're going to get there, and and you just tell me what can work, and you know how far can we get, and we, when we start working from there. Now, you mentioned two classes of leaders: the great and the horrible, so to speak. But we'll we'll talk about that in a second. But I'm kind of curious as to what you would consider to be the characteristics of a person who is a a a, a great leader. I'm glad you mentioned at the beginning that entrepreneurs entrepreneurs serve people. And that word serve is to me one of the critical components of great leadership. Uh, in my book, The Top 10 Mistakes Leaders Make, which has been my most successful bestseller, I have what I call the top 10 mistakes that leaders make. And people say, what's the biggest mistake? And uh, the number one mistake is what I call top-down leadership, the dictator, the control freak. So one of the characteristics of great leadership is they really are, they do have a servant's attitude in the sense that, you know, these people that work with me, they're not just around to help me get what I want. I'm going to help them get what they want, and I'm going to help them be successful, and then I'll get what I want. To me, servant leadership is caring more about the good of the team than myself. And um, so that's probably the biggest characteristic. Another couple more really important traits to me of great leadership. See, I do a lot of speaking on leadership and I always ask audiences, how many of you have worked for jerks? Like just terrible <laughs> bosses. Do you ever have <laughs> anyone not raise their hand on that no, one? No, it's pretty well 90 to 95 percent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> If they've worked, they've worked for a terrible boss. And I find one of the biggest things that frustrates people is poor delegation. Control freaks who don't know how to give authority with responsibility and they don't listen. You know, people, my boss just will not listen. She thinks she has all the answers. And so to me, that's top down control freak and, and a really great characteristic of good leadership and a great entrepreneur is they listen and they learn. They listen and they learn. Yeah. And that makes them better leaders. And people like to be heard. And they like to feel like, well, you know, he may not have gone the way I just I thought we should on this thing, but I really feel he listened to me. Indeed. The, I, I can hear you completely on that one. Now, when you say things like, I guess, you, you, you probably have a different definition, though, of what even listening is than what most people might you know, think of as listening. I mean, someone themselves right now could say, yeah, I listen to my people. And that's probably the very candidate that you probably want to talk to. But what, what does listening actually entail in your, in your world? Yeah, to me, uh, I'm not just waiting for them to be quiet so I can start talking again. <laughs> That's not listening. <laughs> and if you know people like that, you know, they'll shut up long enough for you to get a few words out, then they'll keep going. To me, uh, communication, you know, talking is throwing words at people. Communication is getting through. And listening 
is really absorbing what people are saying and not just waiting for your comeback. In fact, I always tell leaders that want to learn how to be a better listener, say back to that person what they just said. Like, okay, what you just said to me was da 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 you know? That's a great way to know if the leader really heard what the person was saying. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. So what has been some of the greatest things, that, like when you're working with individuals, what have been some of the things where you've seen people go, you, you're not listening? What, how can someone tell, you know, if I'm, how do I help that person become a better listener? <laughs> My oldest son right now is working in a company for a, an owner boss. And by the way, a lot of you who are listening are owners of your own companies. And there's this owner's trap a founder's trap, I call it, people that own their own business and sometimes they create a family business, they can be particularly guilty of this not listening because it's their company. They founded it. My son works for a guy like that. And, um, you know, recently the guy said, you know, we're kind of in trouble. Our franchisees are upset with us. We need some new ideas. I want everybody to come to a meeting and give us our ideas. And my son wrote this amazing report on what he's a vice president of marketing, what they needed to do to turn things around. He gave the report and there was complete silence. And it was like, next. Wow. And they didn't pay any attention to his ideas. To me, that's terrible listening. A boss who gives lip service to saying, hey, I want your ideas, but they're such um, controlling owners of the company that they think, well, it's my company. I own it, so I know best. That's a real trap. That's a bad leadership trap to fall into because I don't think just because you're the owner, you know best about everything. And the best thing to do, you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses. The best thing to do is hire toward your weaknesses and surround yourself with people that are strong where you're weak. And then you can contribute what you're good at, but you really need to listen to the team. I think teams make a lot better decisions and strategies than just individuals. Agreed. Uh, in fact, I'm always striving to be the least uh, knowledgeable person on the team. That's my Good goal. for you. I like that. <laughs> that means you're mining for information and knowledge from other people. I, I just know that I don't have all the answers. And uh, every time I listen to them, it always goes better. Well, you know, a boss that gets up in front of his people or her people and says, I don't know all the, all the answers, that goes a long way. <laughs> well, uh, I've got lots of mistakes to prove it. So they 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 know me by now. <laughs> like, hey, let's yeah. let's figure this out together because I don't know. Or what do you guys think we should do? So w- here's something that I see a lot, especially as I'm working. We you know we tend to work with a number of people who are small entrepreneurs. Maybe they you know figuring out their first ten units, twenty units, or especially what happens around the time they hit about fifty units of property where they really need to do some expansion and possibly some internal hiring that they have a challenge with actually letting go of some of these pieces that are required to continue to build the business. Is this something that's common? How does one deal with that? It's totally common. It's totally common because it's, you know, you're moving from uh, controlling everything and everything's informal to a more formal company because you're you're starting to put systems in place because you have to start hiring people. And I like to say the biggest job of leadership is hiring the right people. And you talk about mistakes I've made. People ask me, Hans, what are some of your biggest mistakes? I said, hiring the wrong people. (laughs) And so, uh, but once you hire people, then then you're at a critical junction. For some of you listening, when, when your company gets to that place and the number of units you have of real estate, all of a sudden, maybe it's the first time in your life You've had employees, people that look to you. And so guess what? You are now a leader. And how you treat that person is going to have a huge effect on the success of your business. So, yes, it's a common transition that you have to make from being just an entrepreneur, flying solo, being totally independent, not having to count on anybody else, to all of a sudden you have to count on other people. And that's when you have to shift into learning how to be a good leader. Well, and and you're bringing up some things that I know I've personally stubbed my toe on more than once uh, in terms of hiring the wrong people, hiring the wrong contractors, um, all of those things. So I'm going to ask you the question that I am asked 
too many times and do not have the perfect answer for. Uh, how do you hire the right person from the beginning? <laughs> well, I laugh because uh, with all the great answers I'm just about to give you, <laughs> you're still going to make mistakes. <laughs> Sadly, you know, if there's one thing that I advise people nowadays is don't hire people permanently. Hire them on a six-month contingency because you really can't learn about people nowadays because of all the HR laws, you know. People aren't going to give you honest references anymore because they're afraid of a lawsuit or something. So the best thing you can do is say, I'm going to hire you provisionally for six months. And, you know, at the end of six months, you can decide whether you like this, if it fits you. And I'll decide if you fit this. And if I decide, no, there's no hard feelings. The worst yeah. thing you can do is just promise a person an open-ended job, and then after six months, you realize, oh, my gosh, I made a huge mistake. Usually after about a month, <laughs> you can actually tell. So that's my first piece of advice is um, hire on a provisional basis. Secondly, I look for uh, four Cs. I look for character, which is important to me. You know, is this per a person of integrity, uh, a competence? Can they do the skill? And then I look for chemistry. How's the chemistry between me and this person? You know, is this the kind of person I wouldn't mind going and hanging out at Starbucks? You know, we have good personal chemistry. Mm. And that's kind of a hard thing to describe, but you know it when you see it. And then fifth, the fourth thing is what I call culture. And that is um, I'm a big fan of corporate culture. And every family has a culture. Every business has a culture. And that's how we do things around here, your values. And that's the question – does this person fit with my values about this business? So you look for those things. So now I bet your next question is how do you find out? Well, I, I was actually just – I was thinking about the, these four Cs, and I was thinking, you know, character, confidence. Those can occasionally be tested for to some degree. The chemistry and culture, you tend – I tend to find that out over time, and I've I've made – I, I'm thinking of specific instances where I know I've made very, very real mistakes in the chemistry and culture <laughs> department uh, where, you know, the person was very competent, and but it had the right character, but we could just not get them. And it's not necessarily get along with me as much as it's get along with the other people who are also a part of the company and trying to figure out how to... How to guess, you know, to some degree, or like, are, are you going to be able to get along with this person in this role? It it becomes like this hornet's nest. You feel like you need a psychology degree to make this work. It's so true, Jay. And I that's why I say hire them provisionally for three to six months, because I was just, I remember this lady that I hired who was uh, professionally competent. She had a great character, but it wasn't long before everybody in my company said, you know, Gosh, she just doesn't fit. She doesn't get who we are. She doesn't get our culture. And she'd never been in our industry. She'd come from another industry. So it was painful to eventually have to fire her because I did not bring her in provisionally. So that's, you know, one way you can do that on the front end is hang out with the people some. And one thing I started doing is having my other people in the company also interview these people before we had hired them, not just the boss interview them. And then right. next thing you know, the boss announces, hey, I just hired this person <laughs> and here they are. I hope you like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Look the other you people are like, with, right? what? Are you kidding me? Right, what were you right. thinking? Right. So why not have an open interview and bring the person to the, your office if you have an office, if you have more than one of you, and, and let everybody, you know, go out for a meal, go out and play golf, do something to begin to get sort of the soft side of this person and the feel. Are they going to fit culturally and in terms of chemistry? Yeah, and I've I've begun to do that a, a lot, lot more. And we've had many more successes um, specifically. And now I'm, I'm going to say something and I'm just kind of curious to, as, you know, how you feel. I I think in I think as a male physically being male i am handicapped somewhat in the area of putting these that having that chemistry culture feel together putting those teams together there's something that's different because one what happens is that i'll run that same person by some of the those that are female that work with me and they got this like extra sixth 
sense is what I didn't yes. call it. It's, they seem to have some sort of internal detector that I'm just like, how do you... And I, as I've learned yes. to listen to it, we make better decisions. Is that... Is, please tell me I'm not crazy. You're not crazy. It is what I call women's intuition. And listen, my wife has always been a great help for me in hiring people. And she's usually right. But I also had an assistant, my executive administrative assistant, a woman who worked for me for 15 years. And I wouldn't hire people without her okay. And I, that's exactly huh. what I found. She had, women have this sixth sense, this <laughs> this different kind of wiring, and sometimes they can feel stuff that we can't. So, absolutely, you're not crazy. I well, totally it makes me feel better because I'm yeah. just like, I mean, because half the time it doesn't really come out like as an, an explanation of any kind. It's like, oh, that person just gave me the willies. I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah, you know? that's <laughs> the chemistry piece, and it's the yeah, and that's why pe- some people are so naive. They think, well, all I care is that they know how to do the job. That's only a fourth of the whole story. That's only the competence piece. And, and you know, what about the people skills? I had a woman that worked for me once that was so incredibly gifted on the competence side of things. But people said, you know, we always feel like we're walking around her on eggshells. Because we're always afraid she's going to explode. You know that kind of person? Yeah. And her problem was the soft side. She was terrible at people skills. And unfortunately, she's another one that I had to fire eventually, because not because of her competence, but because of her lack of people skills. Well, you know what? Let, let's talk about this topic, because we've you've mentioned it twice, and I'm sure there's some people dancing around it. And I know myself, I can't stand doing it. Uh, when you get to the decision that, you know what? This person doesn't fit, and you got to get rid of them. you got to help them transition to off to happier pastures, uh, also known as firing them. Uh, what, <laughs> what's the best way you found to do that? Yeah, Friday afternoon for sure. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Okay. All right. Uh, and if you go to my podcast, The Leadership Answer Man, on my website, hansenzel.com, or on iTunes, I have episode 21. It's called Care Enough to Confront. And I really deal with the whole topic of going to the danger zone and confronting people. Uh, But I also talk in that episode about how to fire people graciously. And I think we should be generous. We should be gracious. We should be as kind as we can. And we tell people their attributes, but you also have to tell them their liabilities uh, so I think the only thing I can say is be generous. I was always big on giving people some severance when I fired them so they had a soft landing. I didn't just show them the door and try to say, you know, you're not a bad person <laughs> necessarily unless they were. <laughs> right. But, you know, you just don't fit for whatever reason. So I think they deserve a reason and and they deserve a soft landing and they deserve kindness so that would be that would be my um advice but the reason i point people to my podcast care enough to confront is a lot of one of the big problems of leadership is they don't confront and some of you who are listening are conflict avoiders and you'll let it go on and on and on and sometimes we make this naive assumption that people are going to get better yeah. <laughs> and they're going to improve And I'm all about personal growth, but I have found generally if I've already decided this person is not working, they're not going to get better. They're not going to all of a sudden change and start working. And that's why I say you have to face the music and care enough to confront. And one of the other mistakes I made in in second to hiring the wrong people is letting them hang around too long. Once you know they're not working out, you know, do everybody a favor and go ahead and let them go. Yeah, yeah. I I can unfortunately say that I have had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's very common. It's if, like, you, if you're a boss and you've hired people, you've probably had that problem. But we, we always want to think the best of people I do and want to give them another chance. But every time I've given people another chance, nothing changed. Yeah, this is the joy. Uh, this is the responsibility portion. Yeah, I mean, to some degree, we we also have that same responsibility by by letting them go. We give them the opportunity to find the place where they can be happy, and more importantly, we protect the opportunity for those that actually do work out to some degree. And 
it's just it's just never fun. So I'm assuming you've not found a fun way to, you know, make it easy. Or- no. And when I have to tell that person they don't have a job anymore and I think they have to go home to their wife or their husband tonight and tell them, hey, I lost my job. There's no way that that can ever be pleasant. But you know what What else I found, Jay, is a a fallout of not dealing with a problem when you need to fire somebody is the other people in your company it erodes your leadership credibility because they see you're not dealing with a problem. And I, that was another thing that I realized when we had a problem employee and everybody else already knew that person needed to go and they were hurting us, but I was dragging my feet. You know, it actually eroded their confidence in my leadership. That's all the more reason we have to act and we can't just uh, be in denial about these problems leadership is showing up and leadership is taking action well you know at, at this point i mean anyone who's listened this far um we, we there there's got to be that question in their head like why on earth would anyone volunteer to be a leader you know this seems so mm-hmm. challenging you've got first you, first you got to wade through all the wrong people and in in to hopefully find the right person, and you don't really know, and you're trying to do them, you know, you're going after this mission, which may or may not be easily accomplished, and it's going to require not only finding leaders, but the, depending on the size of the mission, you gotta hire people who are leaders to lead, you know, the specific groups of other people in departments, etc. This is not an easy task. Hey, as you guys no doubt are already aware. Finding good leaders today, they're they're few, they're far, they're in between, they're hiding in so many different places. That's where you and I come in. We've got to learn to become the excellent leader that individuals are looking for in various different ways as you are indeed learning. Hopefully you're taking some notes, some tips and understanding some things that you can go out there to do to become the leader that you're looking for. Now, I know you're probably wondering who won the cash flow game this week. Well, that's what I'm about to tell you again. To enter the contest, all you got to do is go over to iTunes, leave a written review, rate, review, and subscribe. Rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. All you got to do is go over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe, and make sure that I can read your username, and then I will let you know on Mondays. Today's winner is Sepper B S E P E H R B. All the way back from 2013. So welcome. Glad that you're here. Again, once you enter, you're already in. Uh, once you leave a review, you are entered over and over and over again. So the sooner you do it, the more times you get an opportunity, the greater your odds of actually becoming a winner of a cash flow board game. So set for V, feel free to do us a favor. Send us your email, uh, your address so that we can get you the game out to you. And hey, speaking of getting back to things. Let's go ahead and get you back to the rest of this interview. No, leadership is not easy and it's often not fun. People think, oh, it's so cool to have all that power and be the guy in charge. But it is, it's tough. It is lonely at the top at times. You have to make decisions that are not popular or decisions that people don't understand because you have a vantage point. I always think it's like I'm flying at 35,000 feet above things, so I see things that the people on the ground don't see, and I make decisions accordingly, and they don't get it. But why do leadership? Because leaders make things happen. All the great stuff in the world, and you know, entrepreneurs create wealth. They create jobs. Um, and they create uh, charity. I mean, look at Bill Gates. He's, you know, it's harder to give all that money away than it was for him to make that money. <laughs> and that, and that's part of the the cool thing about leadership is we create jobs, we help communities. You know, hopefully you're not in it just for the selfish journey of becoming rich or making a bunch of money. But once people make a bunch of money, they realize money's not all there is. Now I can give back. I can help. I can do charity. I can help my community. Uh, I can have the lifestyle I want and I can make an impact on the world. You know, some of my favorite people are super successful business people who are also super involved in their communities in a big way, you know? Got it. Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's, uh, it's one of the fun things I do enjoy is uh, knowing that a Thanksgiving dinner is, well, a, a possible because we had an idea. We went out there and accomplished it, and somebody's got a job, and 
all of these things, we can create value. Now, one of the things that, if you will, play a game with me here. I, I, right. I want to hear what you would say because I, I'm sure there's some people who are wondering, uh, like I am, uh, if, if, and we'll play it on both sides of the fence. But if you had to, if you could pick from the entirety of human history, okay, uh, fiction, and I will even do fictional and, and non-fictional as well, just for fun. Um, if I, in 10 seconds or less, g- give me what you would say who the top five greatest leaders of all time. Wow, <laughs> that's a challenge. Uh, <clears throat> Moses, Gandalf, Mother Teresa, Ronald Reagan, Jesus. All right, all right, all right, got it. So Ding, we, we, I made yeah, it. That, that's good. Hey, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Moses Gandalf, Mother Teresa. Uh, I can tell you that I was not thinking of most of these people. Some of them came to my list, but um, you, you, <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, got it. So we've got the top ten or top five right there. So let, let's play the, the now. Let's go to the exact opposite. So you got a little bit of more head start on this one before we dive, dive deeper. Go, let's go top five worst leaders of all time. Hitler, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, this is a harder one. We don't remember the bad leaders' names so much. Yeah, I can only think of Hitler and Saddam Hussein right now, and the guy who was the head of Cambodia during the, the Khmer Rouge. I forgot the guy's name, but. Um, okay, got it. Oh, uh, Oh, Sorry. Go what? ahead. Go ahead. Who was it? Oh, I was going to say um, Mao. Mao will be the other Mao Zedong. Got it. All right. So uh, that that that's interesting that you it was easier for you to come up with the great ones than the horrible ones. I find that interesting. Um, I learn a lot. I learn a lot from the good ones. Uh, even Gandalf is one of my favorite leadership lessons and leadership examples. Well, that, that I was going to. I mean, when uh, I can honestly say that. Gandalf was not going to be something I was expecting you to say, but since you said it, I gotta ask: Why is Gandalf the gray, uh, the gray, or the white? Which one is it, the gray or the white? Which one do you do you Both. care? Both. Both, either one. Okay, why? Why is yes. Gandalf so great? Well, actually, I have a new book that's just been released that we're not talking about, but it's called "Launch Your Encore: Finding Meaning and Purpose Later in Life." And I'm a baby boomer. I'm aging and. Uh, We use Gandalf as the illustration of Gandalf the Grey was in command and control and had the power and the position. He was a good leader and he made things happen. And then he fell into the fiery pit, saving his team, which is a great servant leadership act. And then he reappears as Gandalf the White. And guess what? He has a different role. Just like we baby boomers, as we retire from our careers, I think we still have a whole lot of life left and great things to do. But our role shifts to a place of kind of an elder who gives wisdom. And that's what Gandalf the White became. He no longer had his position. He wasn't CEO anymore. He wasn't president of the company and of the hobbits and everybody. He just guided with wisdom. And that's where I'm at in my stage in life. I'm moving more toward a place where I'm the man of wisdom and the man who likes to give advice. And and that was Gandalf the White. I think that's just a great – and he continued to be a great leader, but he he wasn't – you get it? He was no longer in control. And sometimes we have to – when we get older, we have to give up control and we have to give up our careers and and then move on to other great stuff where we really can impart a lot back to the world. But it's wisdom. It's advice. It's mentoring, this kind of thing. Interesting. I mean, I, I, I can see all the other names appearing on many other lists. Uh, you know, <laughs> you said fiction or not? I did, I did, and <laughs> even in fiction or nonfiction, I I didn't act. I can say I didn't expect Gandalf, but I get it. Hearing you, it makes perfect sense. So, what I really hear you saying, though, is that the uh, leadership changes based upon sometimes, I guess, age or position. And the leader can take many different shapes and sizes and forms depending on the situation and what's called for. 
definitely as you go through life, your role changes. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, a 40-year-old is very different than a 50-year-old, is very different than a 60-year-old. And what I found as I got older, I did not have the passion for my business and my company that I did when I was in my 40s. And that's one reason I began to adjust my life. We change. And so our role needs to change as we change. Interesting. I, I Well, being in that, that 40 piece, I, I just... Um... I just uh, making, you know, it's one of those things where I, I guess I'm at the beginning <laughs> of that. Well, you're at you're at the prime age of just, yeah, really taking off. And I became the CEO of our company when I was 40 and I led it 20 years till I was 60. And yeah, 40, what a great age, man. You got the world by the tail. <laughs> And it's a highly productive time of life. And, um, you know, we raised our children during that period of life, a very busy time of life. But as the years go on, we change and our roles need to change. Got it. Now, is there anything that we can learn from the the list of horrible leaders, in your opinion? Well, it's back to um, the top 10 mistakes leaders make, my book. Oh, okay. <laughs> and people ask me, uh, have you made all these mistakes? I said, I've made 100. I just put the top 10 in the book. <laughs> but yeah, they were dictators. They were control freaks. They didn't listen. They were very selfish. You think about a person like Hitler. He was crazy and selfish and I just recently watched a documentary on his rise to power and people in Germany said, gosh, I hope this guy never gets into power because he's crazy, he's self-centered, He's it's all about him. Uh, and so, you know, you can learn a lot of lessons about how not to do leadership if you look at the bad examples. But it's usually about selfishness and self-centeredness and becoming wealthy yourself. In fact, Jay, this is one of the reasons a lot of people are fed up with Washington and Wall Street is because there seems to be a lot of selfish, self-centered leadership where people are enriching themselves, not caring for the common person. But I think servant leadership is the opposite, where we empower people, we care about people, you know, we work as a team, and it's not all about me, it's about we. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I actually uh, frequently people get confused when I'm talking to them, and I, I they just mention it to me. They're like, "Who are you talking about?" You keep saying "we" because I, I've developed a habit of speaking in uh, in "we." And when I even sometimes when I just mean me, <laughs> I'm just like, "Here's what we are going to do," because yeah. there's so much to executing any vision that requires so many people that I don't ever want to give the impression that somehow I magically figured it all out on my own. And this is how, how it goes. It just doesn't, that's just not true. So which gets me to this other point that I see a lot. And I, I would love for you to talk directly to this person. There's a number of individuals who either ask me or who I have seen, especially when they're first getting started, uh, where they feel like they've got to tackle their business all by themselves. They're like, well, it, it's got to be my business. And I only want to, I, I, I want to, they're, they're trying to fill all the roles. Or, and this really becomes evident when they are looking to grow their business and they need the assistance of others in terms of capital. They're, they're like, why would I, because I, I get the question all the time, why, why would I want to do the deal with somebody else when I could just do it? I could have it all for myself. And, I tell people consistently, I think that's a career limiting move and, and you got to learn how to share this thing. But I, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts would be if if I came to you or if someone came to you and said, hey, I just, you know, here's what I want to do and I'm just going to do it all myself. You said it. Uh, it's a career limiting move to have that, that attitude. If it all falls upon you and you say, I'm going to build this by myself. Uh, you're an independent, you're an island, you're going to do it all yourself, so it's all yours, and you're going to get all the credit, and you're going to get all the benefit. It's highly limiting because you cannot transition to a bigger company all by yourself. Uh, you will burn yourself out, and I've seen that happen. People just experience horrible burnout. You can destroy your marriage, and I think that's horrible. 
when people destroy their marriage because they're building their company. Uh, you lose your children because you got no time for them. I like to ask people, how many people at the end of their life say, mm, I wish I'd spent more time at the office? <laughs> Nobody said <laughs> Most people at the end of their lives, they look back, I say, I wish I'd spent more time with my loved ones. And the older you get, the more you realize that your family, your children, your uh, your your friends that mean the most in life. So you're going to sacrifice all that if you do it all yourself. And so um, I think I like the... <laughs> The saying, I don't know if you ever heard this before, blessed are the control freaks, for they shall inhibit the earth. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a new and, one. And guess what? Blessed are the control freaks, they shall inhibit their future growth. Yeah, indeed. You know, indeed, you've, got to, you've got to spread the load and build a team if you want to grow uh, beyond uh, your own horizon of what you can do in a given day. Yeah, totally understood. Now, with I guess here's a here's a really good question. I, I know that a number in our audience are either or just starting out, just beginning to some degree. What would you say? Like, he, he, what can we do today to fill this void? I believe there's a huge void in in the marketplace for excellent leaders. Is there like a 12-step program, a regime, something we can do, follow to, to be able to become the better leaders the, I will say, the world needs us to be? Boy, you know, there. I don't know of any secret program or perfect program or 12-step program. I think, uh, to me, I advise people, learn to be a better leader. You know, read good books on leadership, listen to podcasts on leadership, maybe go to a seminar. There's seminars galore, you know, if you just Google them or open your eyes. So I would say uh, improve your leadership skills by reading, by listening, by attending things that will just sharpen your skills. So I don't have I don't advocate one particular program that's the key because leadership is complicated. And I think the best thing you can do is just keep learning. Because, again, I think the two most important words in a good leader's vocabulary is listen and learn. Keep listening. Keep learning to be a better leader. Indeed. So with that being said, I'm sure there are a number of people who are now curious more about some of your books and your podcasts and, and things that you might be able to do. If If we wanted to track you down and find out more about how – we can become that better leader and be maybe we can one day aspire to the level of Gandalf the White. Uh, <laughs> how, how can we track you down and, and find out more about what you've got going on? I think the best way is to go to my website, hansfinzel.com. That's H A N S F I N Z E L, just hansfinzel.com. And, and listen to my podcast. You can also find my podcast just going to iTunes and searching on the podcast tab for Hans Finzel. But I have a 25 minute podcast that I put out uh, regularly, and it's just good teaching on leadership from my books and from my own experience in leadership. So that'd be the best way. You can also find all my books on Amazon. If you just go to Amazon and type in Hans Finzel, you'll see my list of books. And I would recommend the place to start is the top 10 mistakes leaders make. And and, and I'm guessing with a name like Hans Finzel, there's there's not too many of you out there. No, I'm the only one that – if you Google Hans Fenzel, you'll find about seven pages on me. So I'll, I'm the first one that comes up. And uh, But my website, really, I would highly encourage you to check out my podcast because it's a lot of fun and it's easy. And I made it 25 minutes because that's the average commute in America. And, uh, yeah, I would just say keep listening, keep learning. Excellent. Now, as we wind down here, the – question i gotta ask if someone is out there you know thinking about putting on their superhero outfit for the first time maybe they're standing in front of the superhero store right now picking out their mask and cape and going you know what i think i can start a business i think i can do this real estate thing i think you know entrepreneurship is is for me but they're still feeling a little hesitant what would you say to them uh well overcome your fear <laughs> you know, uh, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. That's what I like to say. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. You'll have to step out of your comfort zone. You will be afraid. And then the final J, the word I would say is be patient. 
It will take longer than you think, and it'll be harder than you think. So you do have to be patient because the world's not waiting for you. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but you know you will have to carve out the space in your industry. But get out of your comfort zone, overcome your fear, be courageous, and be patient. Excellent, sir. Well, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to invest here with the Cashflow Diary audience. I loved it. Thanks so much for having me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is? It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. So what does that mean today? It means that you probably need to become a better leader. I know I've learned a lot. In fact, you can learn something even from the Lord of the Rings if you were paying attention. That's one of the things I got today. So go pick up a copy of the top 10 mistakes leaders make. Begin by making sure you don't do those top 10 things. You're going to make your own mistakes. That's okay. But there are 10 that you can avoid by listening and learning from those that are around you and the experience of others. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.